Chapter 1 I feel sick to my stomach. I can't keep my food down. In fact, I never want to think about eating again. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me start at the beginning. The new neighbors moved into the house across the street from us just a few weeks ago. The place had only been on the market for a matter of days before the deal closed. At least, that's what I heard from the real estate agent. Which isn't surprising given the housing shortage right now. That afternoon I was in my office, which is on the second floor of our home, the window of which directly faces the street. The moving truck had been parked there all day, though I found it a bit odd that all I'd seen thus far were movers. Every time I looked up, which was often since I couldn't focus on my novel, I expected to catch a glimpse of our elusive new neighbors. But alas, I was going to have to stay curious. My wife, Carmela, was the one who originally suggested we invite them over for dinner. I think it would be a really nice gesture, she said, while we were eating at the dinner table that night. Just the two of us. As much as I liked watching people through my office window, I'm not particularly crazy about interacting with them. Do we have to? We barely ever spoke to the Carmichaels, she reminded me. I'd love to actually get to know our neighbors this time. Sure. Yeah. I said this so casually, shrugging my shoulders, as if agreeing wouldn't change my life. But if I could go back in time, I would have shut down the idea, right then and there. The next morning when Carm left for work, she asked if I could take a break from my novel at some point and knock on the new neighbor's door to invite them to dinner like we'd discussed. Of course, I said. All day I dreaded the task. It was actually giving me so much anxiety that I couldn't even get any work done. Finally, just after lunch, I decided to get the deed over with. I went outside, crossed the street, and walked up the steps of the front porch. The first thing that struck me as odd while I was standing there was the fact that all the curtains were drawn, despite the fact that it was daytime. The Carmichaels didn't even have curtains, I thought to myself. Did they just put those up? My heart began beating a little faster when I anticipated the awkward first meeting conversation. I told myself to just knock on the door, but that was easier said than done. I'll just tell Carm they didn't answer. I finally told myself. Because why not? It feels like a believable enough lie. The moment I stepped back down the porch is when I heard it. The front door creaking open. I stood there, frozen now trying to think of how I was going to explain why I stood at their door for thirty seconds before walking away without even knocking. Can I help you? It was a woman's voice. She honestly sounded pretty nice, as well as confused. I couldn't really blame her for that. I turned around and saw her narrow, pale face sticking out of the doorway. She seems to be around my wife's age and wore her dirty blonde hair up in a bun. She seemed a bit sweaty, too, which made sense considering moving absolutely sucks. Oh, um, it took me another second to reply, but I finally managed to get some words out. I'm your neighbor from across the street. I was just walking over to say hi, but I, I decided not to bother you while you're still getting situated. The woman smiled at me, showing teeth. You're no bother at all. I appreciate you saying hello. I'm Liz. I fudged a smile. Ryan. Uh, also, my wife was wondering if you and uh, your partner would like to join us for dinner sometime. I was careful to choose my words carefully, because it had suddenly occurred to me mid-sentence that I didn't even know who lived in that house with her. You're so kind. My husband, Dennis, and I would absolutely love to come over. She said. How's Friday night? I couldn't tell her what I was really thinking, which was that Friday night, as well as any other night, were all no good for someone who doesn't like to socialize in general, but I simply smiled and said, We'll see you then. As I walked back across the street to my house, nerves finally under control after contemplating my one social task for the day, 
It dawned on me that I probably shouldn't ask if Liz and her husband had any dietary preferences or restrictions. In retrospect, I'm so glad I didn't. All week, I dreaded the evening. By the time Friday finally rolled around, I told myself that if I had a decent amount of wine with dinner, then perhaps I'd be slightly less miserable. I started drinking before they even got there. Anyway, dinner was actually nothing special. Liz and Carm seemed to get along pretty nicely, and Dennis was your average, boring husband who wore smudged glasses and probably worked in some boring office downtown. We made small talk, spoke of the weather, the stock market, recent movies, books, which I lied about finishing. After we finished our food, Liz offered to help Carm clear the dishes and prep dinner. I was silently screaming on the inside when they both walked out and left Dennis and me alone at the table. Time seems to pass in slow motion. I mean, the guy just sat there, sipping his wine and staring at me. At the time, it felt like such a strikingly dull moment. That's because I didn't know Dennis was about to say something that would consume me for weeks to come. I wonder what you taste like. At first, I thought maybe I'd had too much to drink, or that I'd misheard him. I chuckled nervously as I tried to comprehend the statement. Uh, what'd you say? I asked. Dennis took another sip of his wine before answering. I think you heard me just fine, he said. Then, he put his glass down, licking his lips. What the fuck? I thought to myself. Is this guy messing with me? I had no idea what to say. You're not in particularly good shape, Dennis continued. Plenty of fat. Fat means flavor. I was horrified, waiting for the just kidding to drop, waiting for him to burst into laughter and say, got you. But he never did. Instead, I watched as a single drop of saliva began to slide down from the side of his mouth. He's drooling, I realized. He's drooling because he's thinking about eating me. That's when the kitchen door swung back open and Carm and Liz came back in, carrying desserts for the four of us. Dennis nonchalantly brushed the drool from his face. I hope you're hungry, said Carm in a sing-song voice. Dennis just loves chocolate cake, Liz added. My heart wouldn't stop thumping, my mind wouldn't stop racing. There was simply nothing I could say, so I stayed quiet for the rest of the night gently poking at my cake. By the time Liz and Dennis finally went back home, Carm was already on my case. Why do you get so quiet? She asked. It was kind of rude, frankly. I was still too freaked out to defend myself, and honestly, I didn't even know how to begin to explain what was happening. Hey, Carm said. What's wrong? Are you okay? Obviously, I wasn't. Did something happen at dinner? I can't help if you don't talk to me. I swallowed, then finally told my wife the truth. Dennis, he said that he wondered what I tasted like. What? Carm was confused. As was I. I don't know, I admitted. He was talking like he, he wanted to eat me. The moment the words left my mouth, I knew what Carm would say, and I was right. That's insane, she laughed. He was probably just joking. It really didn't seem like it. Our conversation escalated into a small fight, which was crazy because Carm and I almost never thought about anything. And here we were, debating about whether or not my neighbor implied he wanted to eat me. I don't like seeing you like this, she said. The next time I see one of them, I'll clear the air. I don't know if that's such a good idea, I said. 
I have to, Karm said. I don't want to lose our new friends before we even get a chance to be, well, friends. As much as I didn't want her to bring it up to Liz and Dennis, I was also curious as to how they would do damage control. All right. I finally agreed. That night, I didn't sleep a wink. The next morning, I was standing near the front door, saying goodbye to Carm and rubbing sleep from my eyes. Have a good day at work, I mumbled. Hey, Liz is grabbing the paper, said Carm. Let's run over there real quick. Uh, oh, I, I, I don't know. Carm was at the door before I could protest. I kicked my slippers on and went after her. The two of us intercepted Liz on her lawn just as she was making her way back to the house. Good morning, Liz. Cam shouted, rushing across the street. Liz turned around, a sleepy smile on her face. Hi, Carm. Thanks again for inviting us over last night. Dennis and I just adored your cooking. Oh, it was no problem. Huffed Carm. By now I'd caught up to my wife and was standing just behind her, as if I was a little kid waiting for his parents to handle the confrontation so I didn't have to. Listen, Carm continued. I'm sorry to bring up such an awkward topic, but apparently Dennis made a joke to Ryan last night and it rubbed him the wrong way. Liz immediately looked apologetic. Oh my god, what did he say? Carmen and Liz both stared at me, waiting for my answer. Uh, uh, well, uh, he said, uh, um... She's going to think I'm insane, I thought to myself. I'm going to sound like a crazy person. It, it, it seemed like he was uh, implying that, that, that he wanted to eat me. Carm forced a laugh, apparently trying to lighten the mood. I know, it's ridiculous, said my wife. I told him that Dennis probably just has a dark sense of humor. That he was kidding, right? Suddenly, Liz wasn't smiling anymore. She looked to Carm, dead in the face, then back at me. Actually, no, he wasn't. My heart was now beating out of my chest. Excuse me? said Carm. My wife seemed angry now. I don't find this funny, Liz. I'm quite serious. As am I, Liz insisted. And frankly, there's nothing funny about it. Dennis and I have discussed it at length, and we've decided that we're going to eat the both of you. Ryan first, then you. And there's nothing much you can do about it. Carm and I stood there, speechless, as Liz calmly walked back into her house and shut the door. I couldn't believe what had just happened. And as messed up as it is, a small part of me was actually glad that this time my wife wouldn't try to tell me I was crazy for what I'd heard. Once we'd snapped out of our terrified stupor, we both ran back across the street as fast as we could, slammed the front door shut, and locked it. I could barely see straight. It felt like I was having a panic attack, only worse, because at least those pass with time. I looked at Karn, trying to correct my vision. Everything was spinning. Finally, her face came into focus. There were tears in her eyes. And I could feel them in mine, too. Chapter 2 In light of recent events, my wife and I realized two things. One, we needed professional help. And two, we didn't have any real evidence. Nevertheless, we spent that afternoon waiting in the lobby of the police station for nearly an hour before anyone was able to help us. I didn't even know how the whole thing was going to work, to be honest. I had never been involved in a situation where I had to beg the police for help before. When the cop standing at the front counter finally called us up, he said that we'd be able to speak with a trainee officer in the back. 
Uh, um, is there any way we could talk to someone a bit more uh, experienced? My wife asked. Yeah, maybe like a detective. I added. The cop sure didn't seem to like those questions. He simply gestured to the door that led to the back room and said, You want to talk to someone or you're not? We both nodded and headed towards the door. As the cop led us through, I quickly glanced down at his name badge. Officer Devour. I blinked once, twice, three times. My eyes were dry from lack of sleep, and I was sure I'd misread that. But by the time I tried to take a second look, I was too far away to re-examine the letters, even while squinting. You're paranoid, I told myself. No need to tell Khan. And I didn't. The trainee, uh, predictably, was zero help. I mean, he took down copious notes while we told him the story and all the details, but after all was said and done, he basically said there was nothing he could do for us. Why not? We asked. Listen, he said. I've got nieces and nephews, couple fresh babies in the family. Sometimes I blow kisses on their pudgy little stomachs and say, I'm gonna eat you up. Now, does that sound like a threat to you? Carmen and I were pretty miffed by that. I'm sorry, you're honestly comparing those two things? Carm's voice was getting louder. I'm simply saying there's not much we can do about words. Threats must be specific and targeted, said the trainee. I sighed, told Carm we should leave. This was hopeless. As we walked out of there, the trainee said one last thing with a smile. And to be honest, I think they're just joking around. Seriously. The jokes are supposed to be funny, I said. Different things are funny to different people. He shrugged with a smile. I didn't like what he was implying. In the car on the way home, a sentence came out of my mouth, seemingly without my permission. Maybe we should buy a gun. Carm looked at me like she was shocked that I would ever suggest such a thing. I mean, I was too. Sure, I'd written a handful of thrillery crime novels and done a ton of research into guns for various books, but I'd always staunchly been against the idea of owning one. Until now. It seems like an extreme step to take, said Carm. Besides, what if the trainee was right? And this whole thing really is a joke, and they're just playing the long game with us. The long game? Uh, sure. Uh, like an elaborate prank. I considered this option. That seems needlessly cruel and a straight-up insane thing to do to a couple you've just met. You're right, said Carm. But what's the alternative? It was a very good question. That night, I found myself constantly walking over to our front window. Every so often I'd stand there and eye the house across the street from afar. Nothing much seemed out of the ordinary, except for the fact that Liz and Dennis kept their curtains closed all day. But then again, I guess there were a lot of people in the neighborhood who preferred their privacy. I began taking notes in my phone, documenting their activity. Just in case. Their living room lights stayed on until 9 p.m. exactly. Then, the house went dark, save for an orange glowing hue coming from the upstairs bedroom. I could imagine Dennis and Liz in bed, both with a book in hand, reading, as if they were perfectly normal people who didn't tell their neighbors that they would soon be eating them. But once we got into bed, my wife held out her hand. There was a very small pill inside of it. It was white and looked like a dark, chalky mint. Here, she said. What is that? I asked. It's what I take before plane trips. It's nothing strong. It'll just calm you down. But I don't want to calm down. Ryan, she sighed. I grabbed the pill from her hand, stared at it for a while. Finally... Popped it into my mouth, and swallowed it dry. Then, I waited impatiently for the panic to dissipate. 
I was awake until I wasn't. But it only felt like a matter of seconds before my phone buzzed loudly on the nightstand next to me, which instantly woke me up. I'd forgotten to turn on night mode. I grabbed my cell phone and turned it over to reveal. Someone was calling me from a private number. My first thought was that it was potentially someone from the police station. Maybe they found some useful information, I convinced myself. You should pick up the phone. So I did. Hello? I said softly, trying not to wake up Kim. But there was no one on the other end. Hello? Is anyone there? Then, I heard something. At first, it sounded wet, like a tongue clicking or saliva spattering. Then, that wetting coldness grew into a chomping. That's when I realized what I was hearing. It was the sound of someone eating, as if they'd placed the phone directly up to their mouth while attempting to masticate as loudly as possible. Who is this? I demanded to know. The sounds continued, seemingly getting louder and more intense. It felt like I was dreaming. For a minute, I wondered if I was... Wait, what was in that pill? Was it Xanax? Something else? I should have asked. Why didn't I? Please, I begged. Why are you doing this to us? Finally, the chewing stopped. Silence. Just heavy breathing. Then, a man whispered something into the speaker. Food is still clearly in his mouth. Because I need to know how you taste. Suddenly, a level of fear swept over me that I didn't even know was possible. I dropped the phone. I'm not even sure I hung up. I just started shaking and shivering as if I were suddenly in a blizzard. Please wake up, I told myself. You're dreaming. This is all a dream. That's when I heard my wife say, Ryan? She flipped her bedside lamp on, and the dim light was somehow blinding. What happened? I... I... I still didn't know. Was it real, or just a dream? But I knew how to find out. I grabbed my phone, went to the call log, and there it was. A single call from one minute ago, which lasted exactly 36 seconds. What is it? She asked again. I'm so scared, Carm. Is all I could say. Chapter 3 After the disturbing late night call, Carm and I couldn't sleep, obviously. We agreed that if it happened again, we'd use her phone to record the conversation, then forward it to the police. Luckily for us, my cell stayed silent for the rest of the night, save for the occasional spam email. They're trying to torture us, she finally whispered in the dark. Well, it's working, I responded. Should we, I don't know, look into moving? This is our home, Ryan. She was right, but that was also the point. It occurred to me right then that no one should feel unsafe in their own homes. Therefore, action needed to be taken. The next morning, Cam couldn't play hooky again. Her boss had apparently chewed her out pretty bad for taking a single sick day yesterday. Asshole. Don't worry about me. Let's hold her. I'll be fine. Are you sure? Yeah. And I knew I would be. Because I had a plan. First, I phoned the police station to tell them about the strange call I'd received in the middle of the night. As I suspected, they failed to take the threat seriously, or even acknowledge that it was a threat at all. 
but after a bit of begging, Officer Devour at the front desk said he'd arranged for someone to stop by Liz and Dennis's place to issue them a formal warning regarding the recent incident report. At least now they'll know that the police are involved, I thought to myself. Maybe they'll put an end to this once and for all. But just in case it didn't, I decided that I should take a trip to my local gun store. It turned out that acquiring a firearm in the state I lived in was a staggeringly simple process. The guy at the counter was able to get an OK from his computer system in about 30 minutes, the duration of which I spent next door at a local deli trying to push a turkey sandwich down my throat. I took a few bites before I had to stop. It had been hard for me to eat much of anything since everything started, and slimy deli meat sure didn't make that task easier. Once I took care of the paperwork, also easy, I drove the weapon back to my place, feeling good and protected for the first time in a long time. I decided I wouldn't tell Carm about the gun, but only because, one, I was hoping I wouldn't have to use it, and, two, I didn't want her to be paranoid about having one in the house. That afternoon, while she was at work, I spent some time fiddling with the thing making sure I got accustomed to the weight and feel and that everything was working properly. Then, I turned the safety on and stuck it under my mattress for easy emergency access. For the rest of the day, I sat in my office upstairs, not working, but rather waiting for the police to pay my neighbors a little visit. Needless to say, I didn't get any writing done. The cop car didn't pull up to their house until almost 5 p.m., which I guess proves how profoundly unserious our local police department considered the situation. I sat up and watched as a uniformed officer, he wasn't anyone I'd met previously, got out of his car and knocked on the neighbor's door. Without much of a delay, Dennis answered. He was smiling, and I could tell just by looking at him that he was pretending to be clueless about the whole situation. My jaw dropped as the officer turned back to his car after only a brief, maybe 60 second conversation. But even stranger was the fact that instead of getting back into his cruiser, the cop kept walking and headed straight toward my home. Officer Edder brought nothing but bad news to my door. He's lying, I blurted out. I know what he said to me at dinner. Then Liz said it again, right in front of my wife. You could ask her if you don't believe me. He shook his head and sighed. Look, all we have here is your word against his, and he says that you're the one who's been harassing him and his lady ever since they moved in. Me? Oh, wait a minute. He put his hands up, signaling that he didn't want to hear what I had to say. He chalked the whole thing up to a neighborly dispute and said that I should simply stay away from Dennis and his wife if I wanted to avoid a restraining order. I couldn't believe it, but there was nothing I could do. I just nodded, let him go, then shut my door. Afterward, I looked outside, checking the neighbor's house again. That's when I saw Dennis's pale face peering out from behind the curtains before he smiled, then disappeared back into the house. When Carm got home from work, I didn't lie to her. Rather, I decided to tell her a slightly less true version of the truth. The police gave them a severe warning, I said, and they assured us that we wouldn't have any more issues. Well, that's a relief. I'm just glad they're finally taking this seriously. Me too. I'm not sure why I said all that. I guess I just very badly wanted it to be true. That night, I actually was able to get a bit of sleep, which surprised me. Maybe it was because I knew I finally had something to protect me, nestled underneath my mattress. But then, around 3.40 a.m., something woke me up. It was the automatic lights in our backyard, which are so bright that they shine right through the thick curtains in our bedroom. Every once in a while, a coyote or small animal, like a rabbit, would set the light off, but I figured I'd better go check it out, just to be safe. I silently sat up 
made my way over to the window and looked outside, just as the timer turned back off and the yard once again returned to darkness. As I let my eyes adjust, still half asleep, I waited patiently to see if the lights would be triggered again, but there was nothing. Just night. I was just about to go back to bed when the lights flashed on again. And that's when I saw it. There was a figure, dressed in all black, who quickly moved out of my field of vision and into my blind spot, which was close to our sliding back door. Someone was in my yard. I gasped so loudly that I woke my wife up. Ryan? What is it? She groaned and sat up, suddenly alerted. Call the police, I said, reaching underneath the mattress to feel around and grab the gun. What's happening? Just do it, Carm. I yelled, finally pulling out the weapon. I quickly turned the safety off and made my way out of the room. What the fuck? She screamed. Where did you get that? I was already in the hallway when I answered. Just call 911. Now. I felt like I was in a movie or something as I hurried down the stairs, gun in hand. My hands were shaking as I opened the back sliding door and edged outside. I was terrified, but there was also a part of me that wanted to catch Dennis in the act, before he'd gotten off by lying. But this time, he was trespassing. I know you're out here, I shouted, trying to hide the fear in my voice. I've got a gun, and I'm not afraid to use it. The floodlights flashed on again, but every few seconds they'd turn off, and I'd have to wave my hands around to make sure I wasn't swallowed by the dark. I know you're here, Dennis, I shouted again as I wandered around the dark yard. This ends tonight. All I could hear were the sounds of silence. Then, in the distance, something faint. Sirens. The cops were on their way. Oh, thank God, I thought. Here comes the cavalry. As the sirens grew nearer, I lowered my gun and came to the conclusion that whoever was roaming around my yard was now gone. But that's when I saw it. It was a single porcelain plate placed right outside our sliding glass door. I must have walked right past it when I stumbled out into the yard, shaking like a leaf and too on edge to notice. I walked over to inspect the plate. On it was a raw slab of meat, sitting in a pool of bloody juices. My heart started beating again, faster and faster, as I looked to a note that had been left next to it. It simply read, You are nothing but meat. I gagged thoroughly as a realization hit me. That piece of meat didn't come from an animal. It came from a human. Chapter 4 Within a matter of minutes, our street had transformed into a spectacle of red and blue lights, flashing and flickering in the night. Nosy neighbors stumbled out of their houses, wearing robes and slippers and confused faces. And for obvious reasons, both Dennis and Liz remained inside their home. The two officers that showed up, who I recognized as Edder and Devour, seemed unreasonably calm as we explained the situation, paranoia and fear still pumping through our veins. I want that meat tested, I kept saying. It came from a human. I know it did. Easy now, said Edda. We're gonna get it all bagged up, don't you worry about it. Meanwhile, Devour asked pointed questions at my wife. Did you actually uh, see the intruder, ma'am? No, I, I didn't, she admitted. But I believe my husband, and obviously someone was here. How else did that plate get there? Officer Devour simply shrugged, as if he didn't have an answer, but didn't need one. I don't know, but we're gonna put this all down in the report. Enough with the reports! I snapped. I want Dennis arrested for trespassing, right fucking now! Unless you have some type of surveillance cameras, we can't do that, said Edda, 
A few years ago, Carm had brought up the idea of potentially getting some of those ring cameras to put around our house, but I dismissed it because nothing bad ever happened in our neighborhood. What a fucking idiot. The cops were just about to leave for the night when my gun fell out of my waistband and toppled into the dirt. I'm not quite sure why that made me nervous, since I'd acquired it via a legal and legit process, but as I mumbled sorry and stuffed it back into the waistband of my pajama pants, they both shared a terrible look, as if I was the one who was now in trouble. Sir, do you have documentation for that weapon? Asked Devour. Of course, I said. It's in the house. I ran upstairs to my office, grabbed the papers from my desk, and brought them back down to be inspected by the officers. Edder and Devour took the packets, then went back to the cruiser, where they seemed to search for something on their little computer, which caused them to mumble a lot and shake their heads. When they finally came back over, what they said blew my mind. We're gonna need to confiscate the gun. What? Why? The store failed to run the appropriate background check. Also, a couple of key forms are missing. No. I sighed. You can't take it away from me. It's just until things get patched up, sir. I went apeshit. You're doing this on purpose. I screamed. This isn't right. Carm was tugging at my sleeve, trying to get me to calm down. Ryan, just give them the fucking gun. I didn't want to do that. But it wasn't until Edder and Devour both placed a hand on their own weapons that I considered complying. I mean, they were uniformed officers. They could have me arrested or, worse, shoot me. What the hell was I supposed to do? I handed the heavy metal weapon over to them before realizing that I was now completely and totally unable to protect myself. The sun soon began to rise, and we hadn't slept. After the police left, Carmen and I did a sweep of our entire house, just in case. But of course, we found nothing and no one. So, we sat at the kitchen table, still worked up, still terrified for our lives. You have to work soon? I reminded Carm. Fuck that, she said. I'm not going. It was quiet for a while. Then, I proposed an idea. I think we should find somewhere else to stay. Just for a few nights. We can try the motel, just past the highway. The last time I'd driven by that motel, I remember thinking how dirty and disgusting it looked. Maybe we'd get bed bugs or something, but hey, that was better than being eaten. Okay, she finally said. I'm gonna pack a bag. We arrived at the motel in the early morning and paid the guy at the front counter. We probably looked absolutely insane. Two crazy people, dark bags under their eyes, showing up at a motel with two backpacks at 6.38 in the morning on a random Tuesday. But there we were. The room was, in fact, dirty. It was also small and smelled like rotten eggs. But that didn't matter. We both collapsed onto the hard mattress and slept for almost 15 hours straight. It was the first time we'd felt safe in days. Our new neighbors were no longer our new neighbors. That night, after the mini coma, I went across the street and grabbed a bunch of food from Taco Bell, and Carm and I feasted as if we hadn't eaten in years. To be clear, I asked for everything vegetarian-style, which is the thing they do, apparently. Afterward, we each took a turn using the shitty shower in the shitty bathroom, then returns to the hard bed. I turned the TV on and flipped through the channels while I considered our remaining options. I think the police are involved, I said, knowing how that sounded. Ryan, think about it. That's why they took the gun. Or the store really did fuck up the paperwork. I shook my head. But no, they didn't. There was a long, pregnant pause. So, what are you saying? She asked. That there's some cannibalistic cult that wants to eat us and only us. Because we're that special? 
Not just us, I said. My guess is they've been doing this for quite some time. We aren't the first and won't be the last. Carm went silent for a while before saying, I'm going back to bed. I got up, filled two dusty glasses with water from the sink, and placed one on each nightstand. When I took a sip, my instinct was to spit the liquid out, but not because of the taste, though that wasn't pleasant either. It was more so the fact that the temperature of the stuff was piping hot. I'm gonna go get some ice, I said. When I come back, I'll knock three times, and you'll know it's me. Don't open the door for anyone else, okay? Sure, she said, though I could tell she considered my plan a needless precaution. The motel was eerily quiet as I walked down the outdoor corridor, finally arriving at the ice machine. When the clear cubes shot out into the bucket, the machine made a terrible noise, almost like the sound of an animal dying. When I got back to the room, I knocked three times. Then, I waited. Silence. This time, I pounded the door with the ball of my fist. Still, nothing. I began to panic. Corn? I shouted, slamming the wood now. Open the door! Maybe she's just in the bathroom, I thought. She'll open up any second. But she didn't. And that's when I knew I had to break down the door. I'd actually done research into this for a book once. I knew exactly where to kick the door and with which part of my foot, which is why it only took me two tries before the door cracked open and I rushed inside. Come? My heart was racing as I looked around. I'd never been more scared. The bed was empty, and the sheets were now a mess, as if someone had thrown them off haphazardly. I ran across the room and into the bathroom, and that's when I saw the window. Wide open. Ripped curtains now blowing in the warm night air. I stuck my head out the window and peered out into a dimly lit parking lot. Carm! I screamed out into the void. Then, in the distance, I saw something. A black and white car speeding off into the night. It disappeared down the boulevard. I almost threw up as the revelation hit me. That was a police car. I instinctively almost called 911 before realizing I couldn't do that. There was now no one left to help me. Not even my wife. I was alone. They had taken her. Soon, they'd be tasting her. And I was next. Chapter 5 This will be my last update. After you read this, you'll understand why. After Carm was taken, I didn't know what to do. The local police department couldn't be trusted. Perhaps I could get in touch with someone from the FBI, but by then, it would be far too late. I'm not saying I did the smartest thing, but it was the only thing that came to mind at the time. Nothing was going to stop me from getting my wife back. And so, I got in my car, drove back to the old neighborhood, and parked across the street from the neighbor's place. I sat in the driver's seat, heart racing, as I scoped out the place. As usual, the neighbor's house was dark. There were two cars in the driveway, which belonged to Dennis and Liz but no police cruisers in sight. Had the officers brought her back here? If so, where was their car? I was about to find out. My entire body was shaking violently as I walked up to Liz and Dennis's door. I raised my fist to knock before realizing that perhaps it was a profoundly stupid thing to do, announcing myself in such an obvious fashion. Instead, I turned back and crept around the side of the house, through the gates, and into the backyard. 
I walked as slowly and quietly as I could as I made my way up the steps and peered through the window of the back door. Nothing but darkness in there. I placed a hand on the knob and turned it. Shockingly, it was open. Was I actually taking them by surprise? Or was this some sort of trap? To be honest, I didn't really care. I stepped into the dark. Sometimes, when you wake up in the middle of the night, it's possible to blindly find your way to the bathroom without turning on any lights due to your familiarity with your home. This was the opposite of that. I was feeling around the dark house, step by step, unable to see much of anything. I felt blind, like I'd been stripped of my senses, and I hated every minute of it. The floor creaked as I stepped again, and I remained frozen in place for a whole sixty seconds before deciding it was safe to move. Maybe Liz and Dennis really are asleep, I thought to myself. Maybe my wife isn't even here. But that's when I heard the noises. At first, it almost sounded like moaning, sounds of pleasure, and there were multiple people engaging, not just one or two. Was there some kind of sick, twisted cannibal orgy going on in this house? Or worse, what if... No, I didn't even want to consider that option. I followed the disgusting sounds, continuing to guide myself through the dark. The moans became louder and more clear, and that's when I realized I was literally just around the corner from whatever weird shit was happening here. My heart was beating so fast, I thought that it might give out at any moment. When I finally stepped around the corner, what I saw shook me to my very core. There were four bodies sitting around the dining room table. A single plate in front of each, and a few candles that flickered with light were scattered on the table. Dennis, Liz, Edda, Devara. The moans I'd heard were, in fact, sounds of pleasure, but they weren't rooted in sex. They were rooted in the act of eating. Each of them made awful sounds as they nibbled on what appeared to be tiny, stubby pieces of meat on their plates. They hadn't seen me yet. Then, suddenly, I shifted my weight and the floor beneath me creaked loudly. The eaters looked up, staring at me. Now I could see that their faces and teeth and shirts were full of blood. No one moved for a tense beat. I... I just want my wife back. Please. I'm begging you. They all shared a look with each other, as if they were considering the option. For a moment, I almost thought my begging might work. Then, suddenly, each and every one of them shot up from their seats and came after me. I ran back into the dark. Carl, where are you? I yelled as I tripped and stumbled through the unfamiliar space. The next thing I knew, I'd found myself at the bottom of some stairs that led to the second floor of the house. I didn't really have any other option, so I ascended. Once I climbed to the top, I felt around and found what appeared to be the closest bedroom. I ran inside, shut the door, and locked it. Immediately, I tried to flip the lights on, but they didn't seem to work. The eaters were now at the door. I had to think fast. I looked to my left and saw a nearby dresser. I pulled at it with all my might and wedged it against the door. That'd buy me some time, I thought to myself. But what about Corm? Then, I heard something. A soft voice, mumbling a single word. Ryan. I turned around, and that's when I saw Corm. She was sitting on the bed, calmly, and didn't seem like herself. 
Con. I ran over to her. The moonlight coming in through the window was hitting her right in the face. It almost felt like some sort of strange miracle that she was still alive. I'm gonna get us out of here. I told her. The eaters rammed the door again. I tugged at my wife, trying to get her to get off of the bed. And that's when I realized two things. The first was that she was handcuffed to the bedpost. The second was... Well, it was now painfully clear to me what those monsters were eating downstairs. Oh my god. Each and every one of Carm's fingers had been cut off. I almost puked. I tried my best to move past this realization, but that was easier said than done. What have they done to you? Carm didn't look at me. She had seemingly no reaction to any of this. I think she was still in shock. Don't worry, I said. I'm gonna get us out of here. I stood up on the bed and started kicking the shit out of the bedpost until the wood snapped, freeing Carm. Then I ushered her over to the window where I pushed it open and looked outside. The second floor roof was our only escape route. The eaters were just about to break down the bedroom door. We had to move quickly. Don't look down, I whispered to Karn as we shimmied along the roof. Blood was still leaking from her hands and tracking behind us as we moved under the moonlight. Once we were just over the front lawn, I saw my car still parked where I'd left it. So close. I thought, you were almost there. I I'm gonna let you down easy, okay? Carm nodded absentmindedly as I grabbed onto her wrists and helped lower her as far as I could until I finally dropped her onto the grass on the front lawn. It was a bit of a fall, but she got up almost immediately and seemed okay. Then, I lowered myself down and dropped into the abyss slightly twisting my ankle on the way, but that was the least of my problems. The car's right over there, I said quietly as we hurried across the street. Once we were both safely inside, I started the engine and locked the doors, and that's when a loud crashing sound almost gave me a heart attack. Adder and Devour were on either side of the car, smashing the windows in with their batons. I screamed, but Carm was silent. Still totally out of it, I put the car into drive just as another body appeared in front of us. It was Dennis. He was smiling at me, the sick fuck. I was suddenly reminded of the night that all of this started. The two of us, alone, sitting at the dining room table. The shit he said to me, and that disgusting droplet of drool that came out of his mouth while he considered what I tasted like. Fuck him. I stepped on the gas, flooring it. The tires screeched and my vehicle lurched forward. Edder and Devourer weren't able to hold on any longer. My blood was pumping as we slammed into Dennis and his body disappeared underneath the car. There was a satisfying thump as we sped away into the night. It was probably a whole 60 seconds before I was able to process what had just happened, or even speak. We're okay, I finally said. It's over. My wife didn't say anything. She just kept staring into space. A broken person. But at least she was alive. I didn't stop driving until we needed gas, nearly four and a half hours later. For my own safety, I cannot say where we've been hiding since this all went down. But what I can tell you is that I have no idea where we go from here. I couldn't take Carm to a hospital that night to have her hands checked out because, well, we knew it wasn't safe. And besides, it's not like we had the fingers to reattach anyway. But now... I'm sure the police have spun the entire case around and are using city resources to try to find us. What I'm also sure of is that there must be more people, just like us, who have been tortured, terrified, and eaten by these very sick people. 
Perhaps some of them are missing fingers, toes, arms, legs. Perhaps some of them have nothing left. But I need you to believe when I say that the Eaters are out there. And they're still hungry. So if one of them is ever bold enough to tell you outright that you've been marked, don't do what I did. Don't go to the police. Don't try and defend yourself and your home. Just run. And do not look back.